Well, all my whistles uh, today, I think, are uh, attention getting whistles. In other words, uh, maybe I have a single whistle for the infield and maybe a double whistle for the outfield. Like if I wanted my first baseman to take a look at me, I'll give him the. And if I want to look, uh, have an outfield look at me, I give him the what I call my double whistle. Uh, they, they get to know it as the season rolls on, and it can't be confused with the, the whistles of any of the other coaches or managers. Just like that, that's all. Whistling Irishman is brought to you as a public service by Columbia Gas of Pennsylvania, Equitable Gas Company, and the People's Natural Gas Company. I hope to present you with the board, and I hope it's 1971 again. Pittsburgh's Outstanding Sportsman of the Year, Danny Martin. Thank you, Val. Member Dapper Dan. Uh, you know, any time you uh, receive an honor like this, uh, you, you must have a lot of people to thank. Uh, and I don't believe I'm any exception. It would be difficult for me to consider this a, a single honor. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I have to accept this on behalf of the pirate organization and also the Pittsburgh Pirates. Thank you. This is simply another All-American story. Local boy makes good. Danny's baseball career with all its ups and downs started in the backyards and sandlots in his hometown of Chester and is best told by himself. When I was growing up, uh, we didn't have any Little League or Pony League baseball. Uh, we had sandlot baseball around the way. We had boys clubs, grammar school. Our high school was too poor then to afford a uh, representative team, so we had intramural baseball. Uh, and then uh, I happened to play a ball one day after I graduated from high school, and there was a St. Louis scout in the stands, and he saw me play and asked me if I'd like to get down for a tryout. So I went down to Cambridge, Maryland for a tryout, and I was lucky enough to be selected to, to stay on the squad, and that's how I got my start. I would imagine when I was about five or six years old, I had dreamed of someday becoming a major league ball player. And any time a fellow that age has dreams of becoming something, no matter what profession that he wants to become adept at, and succeeds in that ambition, he has to be lucky. So therefore, I would say all my life, I dreamed of becoming a major league ball player, and I fulfilled that ambition. So Danny broke into professional baseball as an infielder in 1937 with Cambridge and into the majors with the Phillies in 1941. He entered the service in 1944, playing for the Air Force at Buckley Field. After the war, he ended up with the Pirates, where he and Stan Rojak formed one of the league's best second base combinations. And as so often happens when a ball player bounces around between the majors and the minors, a very special friendship of mutual advantage proved to be the turning point in Danny's baseball life. Toward the end of my baseball career, I knew that I wanted to remain in a ball game in some profession, scout, manager, and coach. Well, I would have to say that uh, Joe Brown is not only my employer, uh, he's probably my best friend. And I think that relationship started down in the New Orleans when it was my first managerial job, and Joe was my general manager down there, and we had three fine years down there, and we got to know each other quite well. And I would have to say in those days, it was sort of a mutual admiration society because Joe was just a young general manager starting out, and I was a young manager also starting out in my field. And we, I think we got to know each other, we got to respect each other, and that friendship carried on through all these years. We've had a long and wonderful relationship going back to 1951 in New Orleans. Uh, not that we're rich now, but we were poor together then, and I think we know what it takes to to come through hard times on losing clubs, on minor league teams, the struggles, the trials, the tribulations of minor league baseball. 
and uh, I think certainly I have a great deal of respect and admiration for Dan as a man above and beyond his capabilities as a baseball man. But things were not all moonlight and roses in New Orleans or later at Charleston. Danny was fired midway through the 1955 season. A dejected Murtaugh was on the verge of quitting baseball and going into the dry cleaning business in his hometown. But Joe L. Brown entered the picture again, hiring Danny as a coach, and then suddenly making him manager of the Faltering Pirates in August of 57. The rest is history. The manager who never overmanaged judiciously using his savvy and experience accumulated the heartbreak way which made the difference between winning and losing was named manager of the year in 1958 won the national league pennant in 1960 and in that never to be forgotten seven game world series with the yankees the pirates became world champions Then suddenly, another heartbreaking setback. Al Abrams and Chuck Feeney tell how it was. When Danny had his unfortunate attack, heart attack, stomach trouble, whatever it was, and had to retire, he didn't quit baseball altogether, but he stayed on. And then when he came back, he just picked up where he started, where, where he left off. Well, a lot of folks have asked me uh, why I wanted to get back into the managing field. Uh, that's a peculiar question. It's also a little tough to answer. Uh, I have found out that once anybody is a manager of any uh, organizational team, whether it be in semi-pro baseball, minor leagues, or the major leagues, and he has to leave the game through no fault of his own, such as I had to leave uh, through an illness, you always have that feeling that something could have happened what might have been, and I wasn't any exception. I knew Ralph Houck when he was managing the Yankees and when he got the offer to go to the front office, and uh, he seemed very eager to go there, but it seems like anybody who manages always wants to come back to the field, and that is what the same thing happened to Danny Murtor. Of course, Danny had a health problem, which made him quit managing in 64, but... Uh, the urge to manage, you never lose that. To me, uh, once you get this in your blood, especially being on the field uh, where the competition is, there's nothing like it. As you know, I was in the front office for a couple of years, and and uh, I think I learned a lot there, but I, I certainly missed the field and, and being around the players and the, the competition of the game itself. And I think this got to Danny. Uh, I know I talked to him when he was scouting our ball club, and, and I, I could see the itch was there, and he missed uh, being down there where he could chew that tobacco. I'll have a little fun. You can see that with anybody. I mean, Casey Stengel right now, if somebody offered him a job, he'd jump right in and try to manage. And he'd probably do a hell of a job. In 1960, he beat the amazing Yankees out of a pennant. World champions. Then he rested nine years. <laughs> After he retired, Casey Stengel, and they gave him a rocking chair to rest. <laughs> so he rested in that rocking chair for nine years, and he watched the unsuccessful managers try to make a progress out of Pittsburgh that has nothing but capitalists there <laughs> and steel workers. <laughs> and he said, uh, Joe Brown, I would like to manage again. <laughs> I've rested my heart, and I'm agile. I'm quick, and I can go in and take those pictures out with more success than we're having here at the present day. <laughs> so Mr. Murtaugh came up and started again. And my goodness, in television, you wouldn't believe a man that could sit in a rocking chair could get that strong after having a weak heart. <laughs> and as we all know, uh, last year the job did become open and I applied. And lucky enough, uh, Mr. Brown took my application seriously, and here I am again. I think Danny had a different type front office job than Ralph Houck, who was a general manager. But uh, Danny has told me many times that the job he had as director of player personnel I brought him in contact with the young ball players more than he ever was in his life. And 
this led him to become a better manager in 70 because uh, he recognized mistakes uh, more, I think, than when he first became a manager. So Danny came back, and he brought the Pirates back with him to a divisional title. Now it's another baseball year, another spring, which to ball players means spring training. Cap Anson of the old Chicago White Stockings started this tradition back in 1880. He took his mustachioed athletes to hot springs in order to boil out the bubbly brew and work off the blubber his minions put on during the winter. Ever since Anson won the championship that year, baseball clubs have made the Southern Safari an annual ritual in preparation for the grueling pennant grind. If spring training is a chore for old timers, it's certainly a delightful one at Pirate City in beautiful Bradenton on the Gulf Coast of Florida where the hopes and aspirations of the 1971 Pirates are being alchemized into World Series gold. 11 to 11.30. We all switch. The pitchers are down in the batting cages, come up and help or do their PFPs and pickoffs. The other outfielders go to Billy Verdon out there at Hall Field. The infielder report to me on Wainer Field. Well, my personal philosophy about managing is we're going to take batting practice. I always thought that when I became a manager, that I would treat my athletes the way I always wanted to be treated myself, be treated myself when I was a, a player. And I have adapted that theory of managing. And I have also found out that I can get more hard work done easy than a lot of people can get hard work done hard. Johnson. I want you bunting on the back field over there. And I want Cambria, Justy, Lamb, and Moose down at the cages. Just what qualities do make for a successful big league manager? Who knows a person better than his own peers in his own profession? What manner of man is the whistling Irishman? The greatest living pirate of them all, Hall of Famer Pie Trainer. A good manager will handle his players by discussing baseballs in a nice way. If he's starting to go to criticize the fella of his mistakes, then that fellow will get jittery, and the first thing, it'll worry him. And he won't sleep at night, and he'll continue playing bad baseball because he knows that that manager is only thinking of his mistakes and not his good points. The Golden Glove, Bill Mazeroski. I think the biggest thing in managing is uh, getting your players to like you and do what you, you want them to do and uh, respect you. And I think Danny has the respect of every ball player that ever played for him. Bill Verdon, former stellar center fielder and now batting coach. I never had better years as far as a relationship with a manager. He always, always treated us like men. He, he gave us a, a free way to do what we felt like should be done as far as me playing the outfield and as far as Hope playing the infield, Grove playing shortstop. He let the players play their game, and, and he realized that uh, the Groats and the Hoax and, and the Maserati's could play the game. He didn't try to overmanage. He didn't try to, to uh, make them do things that, that he did back when he played. And I think this is what makes a good manager. Frank Osiak, longtime friend, confidant, and coach. Well, one of the things I think is Danny uh, has a lot of patience with a ball player, and he will go a long, long way with each individual ball player. And as I said, he handles them individually. He gets them in his office and talks privately to them. And I think just going along with the players and having confidence and showing the players that he has confidence in them, that they can do the job, I think that's one of the greatest qualities is patience, with, especially with young ball players. Well, it's hard to really put your finger on exactly what there is Dan has because he appears, I think, to a good many people to be uh, all kind of a lucky person, but uh, he's, he's subtle. He's subtle without being sly. In other words, there's nothing sneaky about him. Uh, I think Dan, as a player without great ability, uh, studied not only the game itself, but the, I think the predominant necessity for a good manager, and that is the ability to handle people. Nellie King, who pitched for Danny in New Orleans and Pittsburgh. He understands players. He knows the emotional hell that they have to go through at times and also the problems they have. And he knows that ball players sometimes do doubt themselves. They have fears. And I think the way you overcome those things, according to Murtaugh, is you got to get out and play. You can't do it sitting on the bench. He has utmost confidence in players, and I think 
that comes out by giving them confidence too. I think Dan found that there are two ways to handle people, and one is to handle them best without their really knowing that there's any handling going on. And secondly, that when there is a necessity to, to let the fellow know that there's a boss, that he does it on a one-to-one -one basis, a man-to-man -man basis. He doesn't show people up. He's not flamboyant as a manager, nor is he flamboyant in his relationship with people. I have an easy approach to my relationships uh, with my athletes, and, and I like to feel that all these athletes realize that I'm not only a manager, uh, but sort of a counselor to them and they should come to me with all their problems. I have found out through the years that if you have a manager that you're not afraid to talk to uh, with your problems or about your problems, uh, he can be a success. And I would say that all through all these years that I have been managing with the Pittsburgh Ball Club, that I have had many players uh, come to me with problems not connected with baseball. And I felt that in my own way, I was helping them not only to further their baseball careers, but also to become better citizens. Now, no one can eat, sleep, and live exclusively with his job 24 hours a day, not even a baseball manager of the year, without going off his rocker. And speaking of rockers... I find out that if I can sit in my rocking chair, just get away from everybody for maybe half an hour, and, and just sit there and rock and think over my problems, that uh, most every time I do, the solution comes out. So therefore, I would say to me, in the matter of thinking, in the matter of uh, giving myself a sort of a go-easy attitude, the rocking chair plays an important part of my program. Let's ask Danny's better half and high school sweetheart, Katie, how tough it is to live with the day-to-day -day tensions of a pennant contender. Well, I think Danny's tough to live with just as much as anybody else would be under bad circumstances. Like I said, we're all used to it, and we know that if he doesn't talk, we don't, and we just leave him alone until he's ready. I'm like any other manager during the baseball season. Uh, there are times when I do bring the ball game and the problems of the ball club uh, home, and there are times when I'm just uh, like every other father, just happy-go-lucky. Danny, to relax, will play cards, pee knuckle with some friends at home, or sit and rock and chew. I lay my cards out now. And he plays golf, of course, when weather permits and the time permits. Yeah, he has been playing, he's been playing cards with this same group of fellas for 30 years, 35 years, something they play pee knuckle regularly. Well, oh, my uh, best period form of relaxation, I would say, is playing cards. Uh, I, I love to play bridge. I love to play pinochle. Uh, I like to play poker, but uh, I don't like to play for big stakes. Uh, we, we have a 10 cent limit in our house. And uh, that's one thing about our family. Uh, we're a game playing family. And also, when I really want to get out by myself and relax outside of the family, uh, I, I like to play golf. Uh, I think golf is a wonderful form of relaxation. The only fault I have with it is naturally it takes uh, so much of your time. And we, we in baseball during the season don't have that many hours a day to uh, spend. So therefore, I would say that my two forms of relaxation are playing games with the family and getting out and playing a game of golf with my friends. Uh, I would have to say my only major vice is uh, chewing tobacco or, or smoking a good cigar. Uh, oddly enough, as many cigars as I've smoked, I've only smoked about two cigarettes in my life. And I think that's because I've come from a cigar-smoking family. Danny was a fellow who liked to chew tobacco, and that kind of eases his mind. I brought him down to an office one day here in Pittsburgh, and this man has spent $50,000 to fix up this office, and it was a beautiful thing. And going out, I said to Murtaugh, isn't this a beautiful office? He says, no. I says, why? He says, no spittoons. Danny's amazing accuracy in expectorating tobacco juice is exceeded only by his notorious reputation as a practical joker. Danny has a great sense of humor. In fact, with this chew in my mouth right now, if one for Danny, I don't believe I'd ever started chewing. I, 
I started doing self-protection because of Danny. And when I was up my first year, he was a coach under Bregan, and uh, he started spitting on my shoes. The only way to get back at it was to chew and spit back, and that's the way I did it. And I started chewing, and I haven't quit since. He bars no one when it comes to practical jokes. He'll pick on Katie, his wife. He'll pick on his own ball players. And I think that's one of the phases about Danny Murtaugh's managing ability is the fact that he can relax his players, get his players relaxed to a point where they're laughing all the time or they're having fun while they're winning ball games. A fun-loving humanist, a canny manipulator of team talent, and a cruel tactics strategist under fight, Murtaugh commands the respect of his opponents as well as his players. Danny is a real easy person for me to talk about because I have such high respect for him, uh, not only as a baseball man and manager, but, but as a man himself. Uh, I guess I first got to know Danny in 1955 when he managed Charleston and I had the Denver Ball Club. And, uh, and of course, uh, he was a good manager there. I thought he got the most out of his players. And I don't think that I've ever, uh, well, I'm glad he's in the National League, so I don't have to manage against him in our league. But. Uh, as a man, I've never heard anything but good things about him. He's got a great humor, and uh, I always like to hear him make speeches. The fact that I copy some of his stuff. Sparky Anderson, manager of that big red machine. Be nice to us when you come to Pittsburgh, will you? Josh, I tell you, you have to be nice over there because to me, you have a guy over there, Danny Murtaugh. When you talk about gentlemen in class, Sam, as you know, he's the class of the league. Danny has great leadership qualities, and by being a leader, I think that you have to instill confidence in the men that uh, is under you, and uh, this is what Danny does great. I never doubt uh, uh, the ability of uh, Danny Murto as a manager. That uh, I think he's a good manager. As a matter of fact, he's a great manager. He's a fellow that uh, he uses lots of psychology with the uh, players, and uh, when he wants to put something across, he he do a real good job. I'd say over the years that I've been in the major leagues, 16, that uh, Danny, to my way of thinking, is, is as good a manager as anyone I've ever known. Well, I think Danny Murtaugh is about as good a manager as I've seen in Pittsburgh in a long time. I, I don't go back to the Fred Clark days. They tell me Fred Clark was the, probably the greatest manager in pirate history. And then came Bill McKechnie, and I knew Bill McKechnie well. And Bill had to be one of the greatest managers of all time. And I rate Danny Murtaugh just a step behind Bill McKechnie. And he could even go on to surpass McKechnie. The one thing about him I think I can say in comparison with all the other managers I've known, and believe me, in my career of 25 years of broadcasting, I've seen quite a few come and go. Murtaugh is the type of a manager that is a very down-to-earth individual. He makes very few moves, and his moves are calculated to win baseball games and inspire confidence in the men that play for him. That's the Danny Murtaugh I know. I consider him one of the greatest baseball managers this game has ever known. He's a human being, so of course he has weaknesses. I don't know what they are. I'd say the one weakness that he had when I first knew him was that he was too compassionate. He cared too much about people. I say too much because I think as an administrator, there are times when the individual must be sacrificed for the good of the team effort. Uh. I think I know my weaknesses, but I'm sure as hell not going to tell anybody what they are. What does the crystal ball predict for 71? Today, Eastern Divisional champs. Tomorrow, World Series heroes? Could be. We've heard so much about uh, what we, we are going to do in 1971. Pirates, I think, in some people's minds, are a cinch uh, to win the pennant. We can't win it with our mouths. We've got to win it in 162 games on the field. Uh, they'll need everything they've got, and I'm sure they will continue to give everything as they have in the past. People have asked me how we're going to make out this coming year, and I have often said that at the end of the spring training grind, if a manager can get out in public and say that his team is going to be competing for the pennant, he has to be satisfied. Uh, this year, I'm going to say right now that the Pirates of 1971 are going to be competing for uh, the divisional uh, crown in their section of the league. Danny wouldn't predict the Pirates are going all the way, but you can bet your bottom dollar he's chewing on it. And he ain't whistling Dixie either. And of all the accolades showered upon Danny, perhaps the old Fordham Flash, Frankie Frisch, said it better than anyone. 
He has the kind of spirit out of which ordinary teams become good and good teams become great. The last time I made a speech, uh, two of the four horsemen died while I was making it. So... It's for Daddy Murtaugh, a man that has been chosen this year by so many notables as the greatest manager at the present time that has come into baseball. Ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply honored to receive this gift. And I think as any other honoree, we do have a lot of people to be thankful to. And I would like to take this occasion to thank my owners, Mr. Galbraith and Danny Galbraith, and also my best friend, Joe Brown, for rehiring me and giving me the opportunity to come back in a great game of baseball. Uh, you know, you never miss baseball until you're, you're really out of it, especially when you have to leave through uh, no fault of your own. So therefore, this is a double honor for me, being allowed to return and also working for this wonderful man. And I also think that this is a wonderful affair that we're giving tonight to honor baseball. And we in baseball, especially the players and the managers, appreciate it very much. I thank you. Whistling Irishman is brought to you as a public service by Columbia Gas of Pennsylvania, Equitable Gas Company, and the People's Natural Gas Company.